Hey guys, uh, this is something that we've been promising and doing for a while and I finally decided to just sit down for 10 minutes today and do it. Uh, this is going to be our kind of Q&A mailbag Twitter question section where uh, you guys uh, have the ability to message me on Twitter, YouTube comments or whatever and we're just going to answer these questions and kind of talk through some ideas. Might be stuff we cover in the podcast. Might be stuff we cover in articles, or it might be none of the above. Might be totally new types of things. So, uh, and the way I want this to work is, uh, for episodes going past today, is leave your comments in the YouTube video if you can. Uh, or questions, right, for the next week. So the idea is we get this kind of reciprocating pattern where once a week I sit down and I do this for 10 or 15 minutes, answer some questions. Uh, if you have, they don't have to be questions, they can just be like, hey, what do you think about this topic? Uh, they don't have to be specific in any particular way, right? So uh, keep that in mind as we go through. This is very casual. There may be people walking behind me. You'll see some benchmarks running back here. Uh, I won't tell you what processor it is because it might be a secret or it might not be. So we'll see. Uh, we have a couple of different uh, things here. We've got, uh, we're going to, so I asked on Twitter for some questions and we're just going to go through the questions and see how it goes. So here we are. First one comes in from Ernie who is asking what my thoughts are on when spinning disks will stop being sold as main OS drives on pre-built systems. It's a very good question, and I think, uh, based on my opinion of SSDs, a very important question, actually. Uh, spinning disks are kind of the devil. However, uh, the cost of spinning disks versus SSDs is just, you know, is drastically different. The cost per gigabyte on spinning disks uh, for pre-built systems and all-in-ones is versus an SSD is is dramatic, right? So think about it this way: um, somebody who's selling a five hundred or six hundred dollars system at Best Buy, they don't really understand the difference between an SSD and a hard drive, which is unfortunate for them, but that's the reality. And if they see one machine with one terabyte of storage and one machine with one hundred twenty-eight or two hundred fifty gigs of storage, they're going to automatically assume that the one terabyte is better. And in one way, the one terabyte is better. You just have more capacity. But in terms of experience and performance, obviously the SSD would win. So it's kind of on the salesperson at that point to help educate the, per, uh, the consumer. And obviously, just depending on where you're buying these systems at, that's going to be a difference. And, and also for somebody like my mom or my sister or one of your family members, for the type of stuff they're doing, web browsing, uh, uh, looking at pictures, downloading photos, those types of things. SSDs just, you know, they're going to make things faster, but they're not really paying attention to that type, that type of stuff. And what matters more to them is how many pictures can they copy from their phone? How many times can they back up their iPhone to their PC uh, before getting a low disk warning? And the truth is, is that managing multiple uh, volumes is a pain. Now, one potential solution to this is Optane or SSD caches in general. And I do think you know, some, some of the tech press were really negative about the thoughts that uh, Optane may bring back the idea of uh, 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 SSD caching and, and bring back the world of the spinning disk. And that's, that's not the end. That, that's, that's fine as long as the performance is good, right? So if the caching technology works and the caching software is, is caching the correct stuff so that your interaction with your machine is still very fast, um, but you get access to one or two terabytes of spinning disk space for everything else, all in one volume very easily, then I think that's that's a totally reasonable trade-off. Um, so I think you'll see just as for more enthusiast-based systems, we're already there where spinning disks are not the default. For our consumer disks, I think it may be a while, and it may be something that as Optane comes down in price, it's maybe even less of a concern or a problem. So let's see what our next question is here. This is from LCTR Games wants to know if the mesh frequency on the new Intel products, the Skylake X and uh, Skylake SP Xeon parts, does it scale like Infinity Fabric on Ryzen? That's a that's an interesting question, actually. Um, the Infinity Fabric on Ryzen is more of a point-to-point -point system. It's kind of an evolution of uh, the interface technology that they've had in the past uh, that, that I'm drawing a blank on, on the name all of a sudden. Um, but it's very much point to point. Now you can have multiple connections between, say, you know, one CPU die could have one uh, Infinity Fabric connection to another die and to another one and across. It's kind of how the, the Epic processor works, and so that improves your total throughput and lowers the number of hops you have per, um, you know, memory transaction as it needs to go between different cores. But the mesh the mesh fabric on Skylake X is very different. It's uh, very much kind of like a two dimensional array that covers 
all these different uh, landing points between your core and your cache and your memory controllers and your in your PCIe connections and interfaces. Um, and so, you know, remember that what Intel came from was this ring bus that was very fast and it scaled to a certain degree. Mesh is a, is is what Intel developed to scale even beyond that, right? So. Um, that is, you know, Intel's going to have a 28 core, or they have a 28 core Xeon part that is a single die, single monolithic die, um, and that is an advantage for them there. For on the AMD side, their cores are eight cores, a p each each die is eight cores a piece, um, and so because they're on different die, you know, the communication protocols are a little bit different, right? They require uh, uh, different specifications, and you know, again, you're, you're looking at the difference between a huge 28 core monolithic die and four eight core die making up a 32 core epic part. Um, I, I would say based on my assumptions, like both of them have pros and cons, right? AMD has huge advantages in kind of their flexibility with binning and, and uh, uh, being able to have cost effective integration of all these different die. You know, one die has six cores that work great, fine, you put it in your 24 core processor instead of your 32 core processor. Intel has to do that with three different die. They have a uh, the uh, low core count, high core count, and I forget the other one is mega core count or whatever. Um, so that they have different ways to kind of create their Xeon and Skylake X product families based on all these different devices. I would say probably the mesh one looks a little cleaner, looks a little neater in terms of its scaling capability. Um, but that's just this is that's just based on uh, the first iteration of what AMD has done with Zen. So we'll see we'll see how that scales as we go through uh, more system designs and as we get into Zen 2. Next question is from David Neil Robinson asks: Will GPU prices ever return to normal? Um, yes, they absolutely will. The timetable unknown. I actually had some people tweet at me today uh, in response to this question that the uh, uh, RX 580s were in stock on Amazon for $249, right? Kind of their MSRP expected pricing point. Of course, as soon as I clicked over there, uh, they were gone, but it had been 20 minutes or something like that since they had been tweeted at me. Um, so, but it's a good sign that things are returning to that. And we also saw over the last few days prior to this that Bitcoin, Ethereum, all those values that kind of track with mining um, uh, interest showed declining rates and you started to see stories about hey people are listing more cards on ebay now and that's kind of the signal that the end is coming however today if you look like bitcoin's price went up 20 percent or whatever so things are kind of going in the other direction it is an extremely volatile market which is why i don't think any gpu company wants to depend on this type of um market for you know predicting sales into the future or developing product that's why it's very risky for them to build a whole bunch of stuff going on. It looks like we had a, a system behind me decide to, to reboot, so that's something to keep in mind. Hopefully this camera will focus back on me in a second. Um, and with the volatility, you you run these risks of things occurring, but it will they will eventually return back to uh, where they need to be or where they should be, I guess. Let me see if I can get this, this guy to focus on me. And there we go. Um, so they, they will return to normal, and we kind of hope for AMD's sake, well, it's interesting, right? So if you're a consumer, for, you want the prices to normalize before Vega comes out. Because if you're interested in Vega, in RX Vega, you want them to be able to be for sale for $499 or $599 or $399 or whatever they're going to set the MSRP at. If you're AMD, there's a happy accident that where maybe uh, undue, unexpected demands of availability for GPUs might benefit you. Because if... Uh, it raises the prices of the RX Vega, they might make a little bit more money, more money on them, or their partners might make a little bit more money on them than they were expecting. Because of the high cost of HBM, um, there's a chance that they were going to have very low margins on these parts. So if while they're ramping up production of HBM2, if the, while they're ramping up production of RX Vega to be more cost effective, there happens to be higher price points up here because of coin mining, it will benefit them. It will temper demand for the product maybe to a reasonable level so people aren't going to get super upset about it uh and it may help them out a little bit that way uh but as a consumer as a gamer you just want stuff back down to the price it's supposed to be at so that you can buy your 1080 that you want you can buy your rx 580 that you want you can buy you know in august your vega that you want um you don't have to worry about any of this garbage that's going on 
Uh, next question, Anthony Lambert. Would be interesting to learn the history of PC Perk. I think we've talked about this on the podcast a few times. I'll just quickly revamp this. In 2000, I ran a website, 1999 actually, I ran a website called uh, k7m.com. It was targeted at one particular motherboard, an AMD motherboard, the very first motherboard that was shipped for the Athlon slot A processor. So for all those people out there that think I hate AMD, that I'm an Intel or an NVIDIA fanboy, keep in mind that up until 2005, 2004, my website was AMD-centric. We went from k7m.com to athlonmb.com, covering uh, more motherboards, more products. We became amdmb.com when uh, we thought the Athlon branding was being was going to go away. It turns out it didn't, but as a precaution, we created amdmb.com, which is probably my favorite site design we ever had. Uh, then we became PC Perspective in like 2004, maybe early 2005. And that was the goal was, okay, we understand AMD is not going to be the dominant player anymore. If we want to maintain a business uh, of, of running a review site, we need to cover all aspects. So we became PC Perspective, and it's basically been that since 2004. Um, not enough site designs in that time. Uh, but we've had a, a core bit. You know, we've got Alan here. We've got Ken here. But they're actually the recent add-ons. You look at Jeremy. Jeremy's been with me forever. Lee's been with me forever. Josh has been with me for a really long time. Um, so that's, I mean, that's the history of, of PC Per in a nutshell. If you guys have any more specific questions, feel free to leave them in the comments of this video, and we'll, we'll answer them. And I apologize for the bouncing on the camera. Uh, up next, uh, <laughs> Kuchuk at, replied in, a, in, a, in before 2 million questions on the lines of how much is Intel, AMD, NVIDIA paying you, Ryan? <sighs> uh, yeah, no, they're all paying me millions and millions of dollars. Uh, but the good news is, is that every, if everybody pays you, then you're not biased, right? We get lots of accu accusations of bias here. Uh, and the truth is, whether you go back to the fact that I was an AMD website, uh, that I had to struggle to get Intel to even ever send me a processor to review. Um, NVIDIA was kind of the same way. They didn't want to send graphics cards for testing. We had just, when, we, when, when we moved from AMD MB to PC Perspective, it was a lot of work to convince people that, oh, it's, it's just Ryan Shroud. He just does AMD motherboards. Uh, and we were like, no, we're going to do a lot more than this, and we're going we're gonna to make an impact, and we're going to matter. Uh, it took a while to, to convince enough people, but clearly clearly we've made it there. Um, just just in the – like, just because this is an interesting thing, right? I know Kuchuk here was, was joking about it. Um, Intel has been a sponsor of PC Perspective in 2016. They – they paid for advertising in 2016. AMD and NVIDIA have paid for advertising on PC Perspective for years and years and years, both. Uh, AMD probably in 2015 and 2016 more than NVIDIA, right? Uh, and then we have Asus, Gigabyte, Corsair, all those guys um, that you see the banner ads on the site. The, tr the truth is um, we wouldn't survive without support from these companies, right? Our Patreon campaign, while I, I love it, and it's there's 400 dedicated people on there that love the content we create, um, you know, $2,000 a month is not enough to pay one person, let alone a team of people, let alone have money to buy products and studios and cameras and, uh, you know, review samples that people aren't sending us, like the Vega FE Frontier Edition back there. Um, so it requires support of these companies. Now, we always have bickering and fighting going back with some of them if they don't agree with our opinions, but we've never really, we've never, we've never changed our opinions because of it. And, and I think you can look at, the fact that AMD, we've had some contention with AMD about what we say about their products, but the fact that they still see the value in our audience, they still see the value in our reviews, that they're willing to invest and support us. Because they because they know that when they do make the right product, you know, Ryzen was a, was a good product. Threadripper looks like it's going to be a good product. They want our audience and websites, not just us, but websites like us, to exist to be able to educate the audience about the positive influence of their product. So, uh that's that's how much they're paying me, I guess, in a roundabout way. Uh, There's a question from Jared Knowles who asks, any plans to benchmark for data science machine learning workloads in the future? Um, yes, Jared, there is. This is a funny one because I've been working with Jared on trying to get a machine learning benchmark up and running on our systems for a while, and he's always waiting on me to respond to something or reply with something or get him data back from what he's doing so jared i apologize to you and um uh we will i promise i promise i promise i promise especially after this ryzen 3 stuff happens uh but we'll, we'll follow up next week we i think data science machine learning testing is going to be more crucial as we go forward cpu and gpu both um so i definitely want to see that 
see that expanded upon. So that is the end of our first Q&A. Not a lot there. Uh, hopefully you found some interesting topics. Uh, but if you have questions, if you have ideas, and this is just, hey, Ryan, discuss this. Ryan, what do you think about this particular product? What about this particular problem? How would you address this? What do you think about this person? Um, leave them in the comments on this video. And the whole goal here is for me to be able to sit down and have a conversational type discussion, even though it's one way mostly because I'm just talking into a camera and a microphone. Uh, but I, we wanted to do more of this type of stuff. We wanted to do more of uh, 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 this type of Q&A content. And I know it's something we've been promising for a while. So hopefully this will scratch that itch. Let me know what you guys' thoughts are. You know, like, dislike, subscribe, all those types of things. Um, you know, the, the Patreon campaign continues to run at patreon.com slash PCPer. We greatly appreciate any and everybody that, that is supporting us in that way. As advertising becomes more difficult, that will become excuse me, significantly more important in the months and years ahead. So uh, I don't really have a closing to this. Uh, I didn't really plan ahead of anything. I just kind of hooked up the microphone and the camera and picked some questions out. So uh, see you next week, guys. Thanks.